Welcome to the Philadelphia Cultural Forum on CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's educational channel. I'm your host, Kirsten Quinn, and I am especially honored tonight because the great actor, director, and playwright Michael Toner is on the show. Michael P. Toner has been happily working in these capacities for 43 years now. His credits include work with everyone from the Edinburgh Fringe Festival to the James Joyce Symposium to the W.V. Yates Society of New York to the Carnegie Mellon Beckett Festival and to local big theaters like the Walnut Street Theater, the Wilma Theater, and the Arden. He specializes in the dramatization of Irish literature. His own plays and monodramas include, but are not limited to, Mortal Men, a Vietnam War drama, Know How On, based on Beckett's works, and The Humors of Ballybeg, based on Brian Friel's drama. Mr. Toner has been an adjunct faculty member at Holy Family College, Villanova University, and right here at CCP. He holds an undergrad degree from LaSalle University and an MA in Anglo-Irish Literature from University College Dublin, Ireland. Michael is the survivor of a terrible hit and run that happened in June of 2015. This did not deter him from getting back up on the Walnut Street Theater stage as Phil Hogan in Moon for the Misbegotten, a January of 2016 production. Michael Toner is a true hero in every sense of the word. I don't know many people who could do what he has done, and his story is absolutely incredible. We celebrate his talent and craft tonight on PCF. Please welcome the inspiring and talented Michael Toner to the show. Thank you, Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you very much. That is uh, too much. <laughs> no, it's not. You it can come really, in as <laughs> really, <laughs> really it, isn't because there's so great. much for us to talk about. Um, and I'm so excited to have you on the show. It really well, is an, it's honor an honor to, to have be you here. here. Really. And what's great is you've been at CCP. You taught here for ten yeah, years, yeah. so you're back yes. in you're yeah. back in the building back again. In my old stomping grounds. Yeah, yes. we uh, actually have a lot a in common, you know, because we you grew yeah. up in the Northeast, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you went to Father Judge High School. Father Judge High School. La and you went to LaSalle. Call it college when I went there. Yes. University. Yes. When you went university there now. Yeah, and, so uh, it's, yeah. That's, it's pretty cool. We it's, do a lot of Irish uh, stuff, too, so you can uh, talk about that. Yeah, 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 a lot of stuff in the Irish idiom. Yes. Uh, well, the, my specialty, I guess you could say Irish mm -hmm. uh, uh, theater and, you know, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm predominantly a stage actor all my career. Yes. So this, yeah. is, this is where we live, really, you know. It, it really is. Uh, I'm going to start at the beginning. When did you get into acting? When did you start out sort of getting I, caught up in that? Yeah, I really first got into it, I think it was sort of just post high school. And I would go to theater a lot, mm -hmm. Walnut Street, and th there weren't that many theaters around in Philadelphia. But I, you know, I, I would just, you know, take a date to theater and, and, or maybe a boxing match, but it was one of the two, uh, <laughs> you know, which were my, two, kind of my two favorite uh, <laughs> spectacles. Uh, but just the, just the walking into a theater and the smell of the stage, and the, I knew there was something magic and wonderful there, possibly for me. And I didn't know I was really going to be an actor mm -hmm. until I really, you know, was finishing grad school in Ireland, mm -hmm. came back to Philly, and friends of mine were acting at Society Hill Playhouse. Yes. Uh, Dennis Gilday, Greg Gillespie, and Jim Pydock, and various actors who have gone on to different levels of their careers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they kind of talked me into it. <laughs> and uh, I got the bug and have been doing it ever since. And as we were talking, you know, when we met, you know, mm -hmm. took me eons to get my equity weeks and stuff. Yeah. And then ironically, I was cast by. Uh, uh, Blanca Zyska very graciously in, a, in an equity role and got my union card on the spot. I think that was 1984, maybe, yeah. or something. And It's uh, a big moment um, in actor's life. That was exciting, yeah. yeah. And, and that was like, will I still be able to get enough work now that I'm in the union? And I've been lucky and I've been graced because I, I've always got steady work. Yeah. And now, as a sort of semi-retired actor, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still acting, obviously, but... Yeah. You know, it's nice to get that union pension, yes. you know, uh, after all those years. Yeah, sure. And you, you still approach the craft, you know, with the same, for me, basic attitude. This is what I love. This is where I live on the stage. And 
you keep forever young as an actor, mm -hmm. you know, by working with younger actors, older actors, and yeah. that special kind of spark that comes with, you know, working in theater. There's such uh, a good connection. Is yeah. always there for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm very grateful to, you know, so many people, Dean Kogan, who came to visit me in hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, the wonderful story, Bernard Havard, when he, you know, he had cast me in Moon for the Misbegotten right. uh, back in May, mm -hmm. and then this horrible accident happened, and Bernard came to the hospital, and Thomas Jefferson, and the first thing he said was, uh, you know, Michael, you're still <laughs> under contract, don't you? <laughs> no. You sound just <laughs> which like was, him. <laughs> which, which was wonderful. You know, I He's said, fabulous. Bernard, I will do everything I can to honor that contract and to live up to it and do the role. So, yeah. And that's my wonderful therapist at Moss Rehab, mm -hmm. you know, Drew and Alba, and so many people there have just been, got me to where I am now, physically and psychologically, Yes. Uh, to be able to do this. I can uh, only, I can only imagine, I mean, I actually, I can't even imagine what that was like for you. That night in June, when it happened, where were you and what were you doing at that time? Were you rehearsing a play or performing I had play? been rehearsing during the day mm -hmm. and then I had a number of errands to do in, in yeah. town and I was coming back to get my commuter train mm -hmm. and that's all I remember. You right. know, the, this vehicle hit me, I think it was on 11th Street below Market, mm -hmm. somewhere around there, 11th and Market. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I have no recollection of it except from the homeless person who found me <laughs> and really helped get an ambulance and saved my life. Danny mm -hmm. uh, was, was, you know, was the right person at the right time. And yeah. We became good friends and I, I told you he visited mm -hmm. me at the hospital. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and then my life was just changed and I just thought, well, there goes theater, there goes everything and I've sort of gotten a reprieve. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I've been lucky too. All the physical work that I did, both as an actor, mm -hmm. all your physical warm-ups, your yes. vocal warm-ups, you know, but that physical work. And I ran middle distance for 35 years, till I got arthritis at 60. <laughs> and then I went indoors to you know a yeah. fitness club, uh -huh. but kept kept that up. And uh, and my doubles tennis buddies, you know, playing tennis doubles, all that stuff, background physical stuff helped me uh, to keep in decent shape to go through the therapies I've had to go through sure. and to get to where I am now. You right. know, so as we say in theater, you know, everything counts. Use everything. You yes, know, every yeah. moment. And you yeah. have to live so, day to day, moment to moment Yes. when something like that happens, which is what you do on the stage. Yeah, yes. So, so those Just two living things. in the moment, yeah. you know, and moment to moment, yeah. exactly what you said, yeah. uh, is how I approached my therapies. Yeah. And uh, and it you know that acting training uh, also helped me get through all this. Yeah, you, know? you have and such great support from my family. Yeah, wonderful family, my brothers yeah. and sisters, mm -hmm. my friends, my the theater community, mm -hmm. the black community, mm -hmm. the gay community, mm -hmm. the straight community. Mm -hmm. the, you know there was, and you know, old girlfriends and every you know people <laughs> I hadn't heard from in years. Yeah, uh, all contributed to this. It, you know I didn't do it on my own. Yeah, and I'm, I got and to meet your wife. there's still plenty of work to go. <laughs> I got to meet your wife earlier today, and, and she's and been remarkable for Joanne, you. Joanne, yes, she's been, you know, she's been very helpful helpful yeah. to me. Yeah. And, and, you know, and here to, you know, carry the load that she has to carry, you mm -hmm. know, uh, which is no fun for her, but she's, yeah, she's done a great job. I'm yeah, very lucky. Has. I'm very lucky. I mean, to think that this happened in June and where you are now, we're, yeah. we're shooting in uh, de early December, yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's pretty amazing that you've gotten that far. Uh, there, you have a great attitude. Were there times where depression took over, where you felt as if angry even ab about your circumstances? Uh, not anger or rage or anything. Mm -hmm. um, Depression did set in. I did have I did have to deal with depression, yeah. uh, especially the first two weeks in uh, in Thomas Jefferson Hospital, mm -hmm. and dealing with the whole situation and and the depression was quite gripping. And you know you're shot full of morphine and right. you, you're on all these you know heavy duty painkillers uh, that 
for me, added to the depression. So the sooner I could get off that, the, right. the healthier mentally I felt. Okay. But the nursing staff there and, and the doctors, the trauma team at Jefferson, yeah. really were visiting me every day. They were by my side. Yeah. And we joke around and kid. They became like family. You know, we cried and hugged when I had to leave because yeah. I felt like I was staffed by that time. Yeah, right. Six weeks. <laughs> Six weeks. I said, I can do this role. Let right. Me, you know. <laughs> we'll write a play uh, but, about that one uh, day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they were great. They were, they were, they were wonderful. And I, so I didn't stay depressed that long. Yeah. And I had some PTSD from Vietnam. Uh, of course. Return and attack me. And again, that was just temporary. Yeah. And that, that went too. Good. I had great psychiatric help from the VA. Mm -hmm. My counselor, Jim Grassy, was on the phone within days. Yeah. He visited me in person within days. Good. Uh, I had a newly assigned psychiatrist at the mm -hmm. VA. I didn't get to see her actually until maybe three weeks ago. Right. But there's that great support staff too I have yeah. for mental health yeah. through my VA system. Yeah. It's uh, and so necessary. I mean, yeah. when any yeah. trauma happens. And to think that you were in Vietnam so many years ago. And got through that, uh, you know. Intact, you know, yeah. virtually intact there, you know, mentally. Mentally, uh, yes. I had the PTSD stuff. But yeah. what really helped for me was getting home and working on script again. Mm -hmm. Even when I transferred to Moss, I told my wife, I said, get my script here for Moon for the Misbegotten. Yeah. I want to start working on the character, getting lines down. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is going to help me focus on something. And it's theater. It's something I love and I enjoy. This is going to help me as part of my therapy. Yeah. So in the hospital, I was starting that, and then kept it up when I got home, yeah. and and it's you know it's pretty much a daily thing now. Yeah. And That's a daunting my, script. Uh, yeah, you know Eugene O'Neill. It's one of his last plays. Mm -hmm. He's a real American heavyweight. He is he is probably our greatest American playwright. And and Long Day's Journey into Night, Iceman Cometh, Moon mm -hmm. for the Misbegotten, Strange Interlude. Mm -hmm. The Emperor Jones. I mean, he was ahead of so many things in the 20th century. Oh. Uh, you know, a real giant of American drama. And to do his play, the second time I'm doing the role, and I'm really doing it, approaching it as if I never did it before, as yeah. if I never knew the character. And when I was first getting lines down, it did seem like I never knew the player character and never did the play. <laughs> because How long ago neurologically, was it? things weren't all together there, you know. Yeah. How long and, ago was it that you did it the first time? Um, that was, I think, with Venture Theater and Harriet Power directing. I think it was 1998 or 99. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, a good 15 years, mm -hmm. 16 years. Yeah. And I thought the lines would come quicker, but they didn't necessarily. So yeah. could have been from the trauma. Uh, but because I've always had a good rote memory, yeah, you know, and uh, and uh, and but you've got aging in there too, you know. I'm no young kid, oh. but just the walking and talking with it and physicalizing things like you do on stage and in rehearsals with yourself or mm -hmm. others it starts to help lock things in, you know. Yeah. And then sometimes the character just comes to you and takes over your body and mind, yeah. and it's like you're not working at all. It's there's Phil Hogan. How, how is that sound coming out of my mouth? I don't know how to make it. You know, yeah. when those wonderful moments happen, you know, you're starting to get a little, a little hang onto the character and the role and the, yeah. the world that O'Neill has created here. I like uh, that you're telling us about your approach to acting and about your approach to a character. How do you start out? You start out with the script? You move um, through it? Or I read the script out loud, all mm -hmm. the roles. Okay. And uh, several times. Mm -hmm. uh, the key component is really the imagination, the mm -hmm. human imagination. How I see that character, that scene, the whole play in my mind, mm -hmm. in my head, and developing that from when you're an early childhood on yeah. is to me the key component. Yeah. You know, the human imagination. Mm -hmm. Physically, you know, things have changed for me. Things would change anyway through the aging process. Sure. You never do the same role twice the same way. Right. You know, no matter what age you are. Yeah. Uh, but I think the, the primacy of the imagination is 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 very important. Mm -hmm. And and then it's you know, 
learning lines, everybody has their own way of doing it. You yeah. know, mnemonic devices, rote memory, mm -hmm. uh, physicalizing, uh, but you know, getting the character down, you know, realizing the character fully is just a constant job. You're yeah. you're never fully done until the last mm -hmm. performance, and even then, mm -hmm. you're you haven't reached completion. You know, yeah. If you're always going for it, you know there's still plenty there to find. Yeah. Things to discover, things to discover with other actors mm -hmm. in the ensemble process. Yeah. And and that's I think one of the you know your wonderful introduction to me is you know there's something very ironic in it because I've really been a, a I consider myself a a character actor, a mm -hmm. glorified spear carrier, if you will. Oh no! You know, and I did spear carrier roles uh -huh. and loved them. I enjoyed doing them, yeah. just being background and not saying anything. The toughest acting is really listening, yes, not speaking, yes, not doing a five-page monologue, but as you know, but standing there and being there for the other characters in the mm -hmm. ensemble and listening carefully to them and taking in what they're giving you emotionally, mm -hmm. psychologically spiritually in a way that soul stuff of theater and that's where the real hard work of acting is for me you know yeah. and, and that's what I love you know listening well yeah. and if somebody if I come off say opening night of the play and uh, you come downstairs to the you know the after play party and stuff yeah. and Somebody will say to me, uh, what did you think of the play tonight? And I said, gee, you know, I think it went pretty well, or, well, I'm not sure about some parts, but overall it's, it seemed pretty good, felt pretty good. Yeah. And, 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 they'd say, and if they say to me, where were you sitting? And then I know I've done my job. And they said, <laughs> well, actually, I was on the stage. Uh, I was this character. Get out of here. <laughs> you were that person. I don't even recognize you. And if they don't recognize me, then I know I've done my job well. Yes, you, know, you did. On, yes, on, you did. On that night, at least, in the theater. Yeah, because uh, you transform, and if uh, they don't recognize you, that's like one of the greatest compliments you can get as an actor, because yeah. you've totally transformed <laughs> into that person. Yeah. When, yeah. You're, when you're working on Phil Hogan, what is like the emotional core you think of, of him? Mm, that's a very good question. Yeah, like where does he the, live? Yeah, the core of, of that character. Yeah. He is, uh, I think the center of him is his relationship and love for his wife mm -hmm. and from his wife, his, his daughter Josie. Mm -hmm. And the, the love and protection and care and regard he has for Josie yeah. is, what, is what drives him to create these schemes to try and get, you know, Jamie Tyrone, mm -hmm. uh, the alcoholic city boy, to marry his daughter. Mm -hmm because Tyrone's coming into money, yeah. and there's a dowry, you know, there would be a legacy involved for her, yeah. no matter what happened to him. Although he loves Tyrone as a son. Hmm. He's had three sons, all of whom have run off on him, and he doesn't seem too upset about that. Yeah. He seems kind of resentful because they all took, as he says, they all took after, <clears throat> you know, Josie's mother's family, you know, his wife's mm -hmm. family, who he didn't care for too much. Right. But this guy, Josie, uh, Jamie Tyrone, for some reason, is the son he never had. Mm. So there's this, he's, he even says in the play, I've con I'd come to love him like a son. Yeah. And he certainly loves Josie, mm -hmm. although the way they show their love, not unusually in an Irish idiom, is <laughs> this bickering back and forth and threatening, you know, <laughs> psychological threatening, physical threatening. I ought to put you over my knee and spank you. <laughs> she has a club. She threatens to clobber him with, you know. <laughs> There's true father-daughter love. That's true love. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where it comes from. Uh, oh, the Irish. And, but they, and they, they start off like that, and they end the play like that. You know, yeah. Get in and get your breakfast, or I'll clobber you. you know? uh, yeah. So it's a wonderful little send-off. But they come full circle, mm -hmm. and Josie comes to realize how much her father really loves her yeah. and why he did these schemes, and it was for her. Yeah. And then that, that love he has for his his dead wife, who's probably been dead many years, mm -hmm. turned him against the church, mm -hmm. turned him against so many things. Mm -hmm. He's an old Irish drinker himself, you yeah. know, who likes to go to the inn. Yeah. It's, pre it, it's prohibition era. Right. And he likes to go to the inn with Jamie and knock a few down, you know, yeah. as, as his recreation when he's not working very hard on this hard scrabble farm full of rocks in uh, Connecticut yeah. or New England. Yeah. And I've, uh, 
I've had occasion to dig a lot of gardens in Maine in summertime and work on New England soil to know how hard it is to till and work. And uh, I've even used, used a, hand, a hand scythe to, uh, uh, to mow a field, field down in Maine, one yeah. of these giant old 1850 scythes. And You're prepared you, for that physicality you know, then. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> acting, you get into a rhythm yeah. and all of a sudden the thing was bigger than me, but all of a sudden my body got into it and I said, oh yeah, I can do this. And I thought, this is probably some ancestral thing. You know, my yeah. Irish ancestors were farmers. Yeah. County Derry and uh, mm -hmm. still are uh, some of them there uh, and just that you know some kind of a ancestral thing vibe mm -hmm. comes through yeah but that that also experience my experience too of traveling around rural Ireland, mm -hmm. Ireland uh, as a grad student in Ireland years ago uh, and oh, as um, contributes to how does this character move? How does he walk and talk? What kind of work yeah. does he do on the farm? Right. You know, because O'Neill gives you a good amount of information. Oh yeah. O'Neill's asides and notes mm -hmm. and stuff are extensive. You know, yes. for all his plays. Yeah. He's like George Bernard Shaw. Uh, Shaw yeah. In that regard. It's very helpful though. Too, <laughs> yeah. 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 He's very specific. Yeah. And uh, you know, but trying to get a feel, what does this character do when he gets up in the morning? What kind of chores does he do on the mm -hmm. farm you know there's dairy stuff and then there's plowing the fields working the fields mm -hmm. and physical a lot of physical labor that's what the guy does he's mm -hmm. not he's not sitting back you know reading the new york times at the end yeah. of the day you know he's, he's a tough guy he's a, he's, he's a tough old Irish worker man. and he's based on a real person as the biographies uh, will, will tell you arthur and barbara gelb's great biography and there's a new one out by i forget who that um uh, Kate Galvin, our director, and and I have shared, both have read. Okay. Uh, but uh, a, a guy, there were, I think a gentleman named O'Driscoll, an Irishman named O'Driscoll, who was a drinking buddy of mm -hmm. O'Neill's in the old days, and went to Provincetown with him. And, uh, and this Irish immigrant guy became the basis for several different characters mm -hmm. in different O'Neill plays. Hmm. So there is some actual real person basis for for my character, Phil Hogan, yeah, and for a number of other roles in other O'Neill plays. It's so good to do that kind of research and to be able to have that because it, it does inform the character. It sounds like you do yeah. a lot of preparation before you even yeah. get into rehearsal. And I love to read books, so I like yeah. to do the kind of book stuff and then the, you know, the other character research stuff on my own. Yeah. A little improvise. I'm not a great improv person, but I do some. Yeah. And just imagining, thinking about thinking mm -hmm. about the role, thinking about the character, and you spend a lot of free time free associating like that that contributes to building this role, mm -hmm. and then pl plug into the ensemble, what everybody else is doing, mm -hmm. because the ensemble is the most important thing, yeah. you know? And ultimately, the ultimate judge isn't anybody but the audience, you yeah. know? The audience are the ultimate deciders. Mm -hmm. Are you the character or not? Is this play good or not? Yeah. You know, it's always a risk. You yeah. Know? Without the risk, theater is an impossibility. Yeah. You know? And so. it makes that so much more exciting. You know, you get up yeah. there and there's that feeling of adrenaline rush. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's how are they going to do, how are they going to respond? How am I going to, you know, find something new with the character tonight? You know, what is that discovery going to be? And, yeah. you know, yeah. the listening process. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I also yeah. like the fact that you talked about the love in this character, because a lot of times people talk about Phil Hogan as a conniver, you know, or something like that, where, yeah, yeah I mean, he's yeah. scheming to an extent, but he's doing it for, for the reason that he loves his daughter. Yeah. You know, and that's like finding the love in the character is really important, you know. Yeah. Um, he says, uh, I think at one point near the end in, in, his, in his revelations to Josie, he says, why shouldn't I want you to live in ease and comfort for a change instead of yeah. in this shanty on a lousy farm, you yeah. know, slaving for me. Yeah. He says, I want you to live the good life yeah, he wants or a more better life her. than here, you know. Yeah. yeah. And it's, that's foremost in his mind, I think. He's quite mm -hmm. willing to, you know, go into old age and death on his mm -hmm. own if she can get a better life. Yeah. You know, he's willing to risk everything for her, mm -hmm. and I think that. That's very important in his character. Yeah, you know. high stakes. Yeah. yeah, yes, I think, yeah, you're right. You can make the stakes very high under that, yeah, under that aegis, yeah. yeah. 
So you you still go out there, you audition, you 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 know, you yeah. do your thing. I, I audition with everybody else yeah. and there's no automatic casting. Um, right. I you know, go out and try as hard as as everybody else. There's like I say, you don't know an actor's career is you don't know from one week to the next whether you have work or not. Yeah. Half your career is trying to get a job. It really is. Yeah. Half your career. We're gonna take a look at an audition piece that you do. Yeah? Okay, sure. Okay, um, and it's uh, Alex Cleave. It's Alex. a first person uh, monologue. Yes. Tell me a little bit about uh, that. Yeah, Alex Cleave, this is taken from uh, a novel of John Banville's mm -hmm. called Eclipse. And uh, John Banville's a beautiful writer. And, and, and I think he has a secret love of the theater mm -hmm. because he's, this character has appeared in a couple of his novels. I forget the other one it has appeared in. But, it, you know, the fact that he came back to it I th told me Banville must have found this character really fascinating yeah. and interesting to him and developed it even more. And, uh, but when I, when I happened to come across the, these lines o over several pages, I thought, you know what, there's a, there's a monologue here. Hmm. This is a wonderful, especially for an older actor, because this character, this actor is more or less at the end of his career, he's pretty washed out in a way. Uh, <clears throat> he's come back to his native Ireland, where he left many, many years before to become an actor in probably in London mm -hmm. and lived most of his life there. And, uh, you know, and he, he's talking about his career mm -hmm. and the waning of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but what he loved about the theater mm -hmm. and, and what he loved wasn't the adulation or any big bucks or anything. Mm -hmm. It's uh, kind of the little things. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's where I connected with it and said, yeah. this is, this is quite moving and, and funny, and, and also just there's a gem of a presentation going on here. If yeah. I can shape this correctly, this will make a lovely audition piece. Yeah, that's and, a very uh, creative way to do it, because there's so many pieces out there that people do over and over again, and directors are familiar with, so to find something, you're not allowed to steal this, by the way. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> this is Michael's piece. Yes, I should copyright this. If you, first, you really should. First I get permission from John Banville. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So let's take a look at, at uh, Alex Cleave. Cleave is the name. Alexander Cleave, called Alex. Yes, that Alex Cleave. You will remember my face, perhaps? The famous eyes whose flash of fire could penetrate to the very back row of the stool. At 60 yard, I am, if I say so myself, handsome still, albeit in a pinched and blurry sort of way. Think of your ideal Lear and you have me. I played best the somber inward types, the ones who seem not part of the cast, but to have been brought in from the street to add plausibility to the plot. Menace was a specialty of mine. I was good at menace. If a poisoner was needed or a brocaded revenger, I was your man. Even in the sunniest of roles, the ass in a boater hat or the cocktail quaffing wit, I projected a troubled, threatening something that silenced even the hatted old dears in the front row and made them clutch their bags of toffee tighter. <laughs> I could play big, too. People, when they saw me at the stage door, were always startled to find not the shambling, shaggy heavyweight they were expecting, but a trim, lithe person with the wary walk of a dancer. All this I learned and learned to play. It was one of the secrets of my success, on stage and off, that I could put on size. And stillness, a quality of absolute stillness, even in the midst of mayhem. That was another of my tricks. The biding beast is always more seductive than the one who springs. <laughs> ah, the stage, the stage. <laughs> oh, I shall miss it, I know. Those old saws about the camaraderie of actors are, I have to report, all true. Children of the night, we keep each other company against the encroaching dark playing at being grown-ups. <laughs> I do not particularly love my fellow humans, only that I must be part of the cast. <laughs> we actors like to complain about the lean times, the stints in provincial rep, the ramshackle fit-ups, and the rained-out seaside tours. 
but it was the very seediness of that gym rat world that I secretly loved. <laughs> when I look back over my career, which seems to have ended now, what I recall most fondly is some dingy hole in the middle of nowhere, shut fast against the loamy darkness of an autumn night and reeking of fag smoke and wet cigarettes. <laughs> it is not reality, I know. But for me, it was the next best thing, at times the only thing more real than the real. When I fled that peopled world, I had no one but myself to keep me from coming to grief. And it was to grief that I came. Well, like you said, I mean, you, you've got everything in there. You've got, you've got some, a lot of humor. You've got drama. You've got yeah. a wide range of, of feeling in there. And it is a great piece because you, you want to show your range when you get into the audition room. Yeah. And you have to do it in a two and a half minutes. I mean, that's like, yes. it seems like an impossible feat. <laughs> But, that. Yeah. But, you know, right? yes. but that, you know, I think that could happen with this. It obviously has worked for you, yeah. you know. I like those auditions where, you, you yeah. know, you, they want you to do, a, you know, uh, two minutes, one minute com comedy, one minute tragedy, and, you know, one minute musical theater, one minute, you know, a serious drama, and throw it all together in less yeah, than two minutes. that's easy. <laughs> yeah. You know, tr <laughs> tremendous you onus on the actor, but uh, yeah. it's always, you're, you're worrying, well, I don't want to rush. Right. But I, but I want to get all this meat into this one thing. How yeah. do I get that into a one-minute monologue, yeah. or you know, or a, a two-minute even, you know? Yeah. Because time can pass so quickly. You know? Oh, it does. And pauses, and and you know, pauses are important in theater. Yeah. In acting, just as much as speech is important. Yeah. Uh, you know that punctuation, you know, that you can use. Mm. But. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a constant learning process, too. That's the other thing about being an actor. You're oh. always learning at whatever age you are. You always come back to the basic level thing. Yeah. Like teaching a master class. Yeah. You know, movement, the sound of your voice, how does your body move. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two m most important things. Yeah. You know, and you work on them. And then getting the big emotions out, getting the big moment out, that can... That can come pretty naturally. Yeah. Don't push it or force it. Yeah. But do your basic things well, and the big stuff will happen a lot easier. Mm -hmm. no. And that's coming from your teaching background, too, because you've, you've done a lot of teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Not a massive amount, but I've, I, I've done, and ironically, well, quite wonderfully, my, my best students were right here at, at Philadelphia Community College. That's so good to and hear. And they were, they were just marvelous. I just would come in and learn so much from them every day. Yeah. And just hand them the football and watch them go with it and their energy, their passion. Yeah. That, you know, the, the intellect they brought to a, a role mm -hmm. and, and just the willingness to risk everything. Yeah. And, and, and the humor, mm -hmm. wonderful humor. And <laughs> we ch I just always had a rapport and, uh, you know, I just have these wonderful memories, so this is kind of a homecoming to come back it's, here. It's fabulous to have <laughs> you back here. Yeah, it's fabulous to have you back here. What are some of the, the favorite roles you've done? You also do uh, solo pieces, um, one person. Yeah, one person plays or, or plays monodramas. Or monodramas, yes. I like that. Yeah, monodramas. I taught a monodrama course twice at uh, Villanova mm -hmm. uh, in the summertime, and uh, it's a hard thing to teach because you do you put together a one-person place kind of on your own and over a long period of time, usually. Sure. Me, I'm, I'm a slow developer of these things. Uh, my F. Scott Fitzgerald play, I think I spent a good four years mm. and read everything he wrote. Yeah. Diaries, letters, all his letters and everything. Yeah. And the, actually, it, as using that as an example, I found an F. Scott Fitzgerald who was very funny and very witty mm -hmm. instead of this image of this belligerent, middle-aged drunk who, you know, <laughs> walked out on Hollywood and, you yeah. know, and, uh, and, you know, uh, very difficult marriage with Zelda. Mm -hmm. And I found this person who was, you know, had this wonderful wit, and even in the worst of times. And I thought, 
there's a lot of wonderful lines, one-liners and jokes and things yeah. that I could put into this script as well as having the heavy-duty stuff. Sure. And, you know, the wonderful novel he wrote, The Great Gatsby, using some sections of that, the mm -hmm. beginning and end. But in finding that character, his relationship with Hemingway, which was very interesting. They were very close, but they had this, uh, you know, Hemingway was very jealous of Fitzgerald. And Fitzgerald adored Hemingway, thought he was the great American novelist. And, of course, Hemingway wanted everybody to think that. Uh, but Hemingway was, was quite envious of Fitzgerald, and Fitzgerald didn't realize that. And uh, posthumously, Fitzgerald's writings are selling much better than Hemingway's now, yeah. uh, which is very true. But uh, the Fitzgerald was one I worked four years on, uh, and... Uh, uh, doing the Beckett know-how on, I think I worked a long time with that. My inspiration for doing Beckett, by the way, was a magnificent uh, Irish actor, Jack McGowan, mm. who had done a, a, a play, Beginning to End, mm -hmm. which I saw in Dublin while I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. And it was extraordinary. And uh, it was when the play ended, and it was just him with Beckett's words, and uh, I think it was eventually filmed and shown on PBS. Mm -hmm. But it was the only time in theater, one of the rare times, the play ended and the house was packed. And I mean, with a lot of religious people, priests and nuns, too. Okay. It was kind of around Christmas time. And McGowan, you know, came out to take his bows, and there was just absolute silence for about three minutes. Wow. The audience was That's stunned. That's a long time for a silence. Yeah, you don't the realize audience it. audience was stunned, there. and nobody knew whether they should clap or not. And then there was just a standing ovation. Everybody, nuns, priests, you know, Beckett fans like me, you know, yeah. just everybody rose as one. And this wonderful magic moment in theater, you know, and, uh, and, and McGowan was very humbled himself. You know, he was really awed at this. And, and he was an actor who doesn't get awed very easily. You know, yeah. a wonderful actor. And, uh, uh, and to see him do that, I thought, boy, I want to do something like that someday. And, you know, and I was fascinated with Beckett and how Beckett uses language and, and how funny Beckett's writing is, right. not the doom and gloom that people think oh, of yeah. Uh, yeah, with so God or whatever. Everything is miserable, right, but, um, which it isn't. It, yeah. yeah, it isn't. Not at all. Beckett can be very, very funny. Yeah. You, know? you did uh, a Beckett character in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, in yes, the, uh, that was One Man Beckett. Yeah, Ed that was Edinburgh One Man Festival. Beckett. Yeah, that was taking my One Man Beckett to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Greyfriars, Greyfriars Kirk House. That was. That's a big they were deal. Doing, they were doing theater all over Edinburgh. It was interesting. I think it was 1984 or so. Mm -hmm. um, but they were doing theater in churches, busking yeah. on the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was quite exciting. And I loved Edinburgh. Edinburgh uh, was just you know the town, the people. It had real character. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a lot of fun. And, and my director had come over with me, Fight Schaefer, mm -hmm. and we had worked a long time. We had worked a year on, together, rehearsing. Wow. He taught at Friends Central, and we would use their, their big uh, stage yeah. to rehearse with just me and learning pr pratfalls, clowning and stuff, Love a it. lot of physicality. Yeah. But uh, it, uh, all that helped his background for doing Beckett's stuff. Sure. Yeah. And then... Uh, I'll stay one minute. My one man, my first, I've done a few plays about my Vietnam experience. Mm -hmm. Not directly my experience, uh, but in an indirect way. Yeah. And the first one was Mortal Men, which I did at uh, Walnut Street Theater, second stage. Uh, on my, before they had a second stage series. It right. wasn't part of, under Walnut Street. Okay. It was on my own. And uh, that was a two-person play. And I played uh, a Southern uh, a southern infantryman right after a, a big firefight mm. where the company's been virtually wiped out. Wow. And Julius played uh, a war correspondent coming out to the field for the first time mm -hmm. and has no idea what the war is all about and wants to kind of find out. Yeah. So I set the play. Uh, I think my friend James DeFonso had directed it. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know James? We had him on the show. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, right. We the, did. the film, the yeah. film filmmaker. And James yeah. is wonderful. He's great. We've done a lot of stuff together. Cool. But I think James directed, and, uh, uh, and that took several months. I developed that actually at what was called the Vietnam Veterans Outreach Center. I got permission to perform it first for Vietnam veterans. 
about that. for veterans in a storefront situation. Mm -hmm. And I was very nervous because this was like x-rays. These oh my people God, I would, be so scared. <laughs> would know the experience intimately and, uh, and would, would be our worst critics. And in fact, Irene Baird came, the great acting teacher from yeah. Villanova and University of the Arts. Mm -hmm. Irene came, and I was honored to have her there. She was a wonderful teacher and uh, really taught me so much. I had master classes with her. Yeah. But um, we, me, me and this actor, Odell Conyers, he was the first person to do the play. We did it and uh, in the storefront situation. And this huge black man who was an ex-marine was sitting in the back mm -hmm. and at the end of the play he came up and he just came down the aisle and it's, it, he was over over towering over me and I'm looking up and, uh. and he looks down at me and points his hand finger at me and I thought uh oh this isn't this is not too good here and uh -oh. he said <laughs> first thing he said was you did good you know and then he picked me up hugged me he was crying I was crying and it was this again a wonderful moment yeah. and then I knew we had a script, we had a play. It needed fine tuning, but we had a script that we could present in front of th regular theater audiences because yeah. this was our greatest, toughest audience. But that was a very fascinating play for me to develop mm -hmm. and get with distance, 10 years distance from my own right. private, you know, yeah. personal experience. Yeah. Uh, then there was, uh, I did a one man Eugene O'Neill play actually mm -hmm. in Villanova years ago. Not of my writing though, that right. was written by. Uh, 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 Patrick uh, Nolan, mm -hmm. and uh, and and Patrick had you know it was three hours and twenty minutes when I first got off book. <laughs> it was the longest thing How? I ever memorized in my life. Did you do that? <laughs> How? And I said, Patrick, you know, dear dear Patrick, you'll have to cut this because the audience Please. will have gone home. They'll be talking to their babysitters by the time I'm finishing the play. Uh, he did agree finally to cut it, and we got it down to I think two hours. 20 minutes that's a long one man sh performance but that's still with intermission that's still a lot yeah it is you know but to be on the stage and, and keep the it. audience connected yeah uh but i loved doing it yeah. i believed in the script and uh, and that was a great experience and that gave me some ideas for doing my own one man plays it, yeah. it certainly fed into me I, my ideas about f scott fitzgerald yeah and uh not sure. Oh, then there was the evening with Mr. Dooley we were talking about, the, mm -hmm. from the writings of Chicago journalist Finley Peter Dunn, mm -hmm. who was nationally syndicated back in the 1890s to the 1920s, about the Irish immigrant experience. And yeah. he's a bartender on the south side of Chicago, and he mm -hmm. talks to this invisible person, Hennessy. Mm -hmm. And that I developed um, <clears throat> through... Um, that I developed with uh, with the help of Barry Sandro, who owned Doc Watson's pub, mm -hmm. who said you can have my third floor and develop the play upstairs, and I did with my wonderful Harper, uh, you know, who was, who was I just talked to her, Martha Clancy. Okay. Martha Clancy was, who sang and played harp, so this nice. wonderful rich accompaniment of her talents, and music, you know. And, and I would sing some songs, but mm -hmm. mainly Martha did most of the songs. Yeah. But there was some singing, a little bit of sort of step dancing, you know. Okay. Uh, and but most of it was me behind a bar, philosophizing. Yes. Yeah. This character Which did is about what he did. the events of the day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And they were very apropos of that present day. Yeah. And even today. Sure. You know, could be about politics, religion, mm -hmm. culture, art. Uh, you know, so and with you know, peppered with this great Irish humor. Yeah, you do. So you do quite a few Irish pieces. I mean, you uh, you told me a little bit about some of the stuff that we're actually going to get to see. Uh, um, yes, I'll I'll do a piece. Uh, uh, another monologue I'll do for you is uh, a poem by Thomas McGreevy, mm -hmm. who's a great friend of Beckett's, mm -hmm. uh, called "Homage to v Verse and Getterix, mm -hmm. which is. Uh, he was an, a Celtic chieftain who was defeated by Julius Caesar and captured and taken in, in triumph uh, through the streets of Rome, a defeated warrior. Mm -hmm. you know, the, play is, the poem is about him. It's set in the present. Uh, Current-day Irishman uh, attending a dinner of a very, very Norman Norman Anglo-Irishman yeah. set in probably London. And uh, the, the different... Uh, different antagonism, I guess you could say, or character traits, or a p difference of opinion between an Irish Irishman 
and an Anglo Irishman. So it's a nice little dramatic situation there that I, mm. I read this poem and I'm, I'm a fan of McGreevy's. So I said, you know, this poem could be dramatized and mm. turn in, into, again, an audition piece. Yeah. You know, I can use this for work. <laughs> you know? Cool. And uh, so, you know, so that's another, uh, another piece I'll do. And then maybe a Yeats piece. Yeah. I think at the end, maybe a Yeats poem. Tell me about that too. Uh, maybe we can well, the, uh, it's an early Yeats poem. It's the Song of Wandering Angus, mm -hmm. and um, Angus uh, was the the Irish god of love in Celtic mythology. And um, there's an Irish legend that uh, of uh, you know of a beautiful woman turning from a trout, from a fish into a silver trout, turning into a, a beautiful young woman, mm. and and haunting and haunting this god throughout the rest of his life as a deity you know that he's seen this beautiful goddess and then she's wandered off and disappeared mm. and he's searching for her for the rest of his days you know mm. so it's a nice little early romantic yates you know that two nice contrasting think, uh, pieces uh, it sounds like too yeah yes yeah yeah you get to so see you could actually do that for an audition for for that Philadelphia Irish Heritage Theater and, yeah. uh, and give them compare and contrast here, you know? Yeah, right, <laughs> which is what we want to do as actors. We want to be able to do that. So let's take a look at these two wonderful pieces. For me, said my host, an oh-so-Norman, Norman Irishman in England. For me, Julius Caesar is, divine personage is a part of course, the greatest man who ever lived as a guest, as an Irish Irishman, cherishing secretly the dream of his father's dreaming that set loveliness by the waters in the west, ere ever the roving gangsters looked on Ireland, from the verdant turf that once was Cistercian whiteness, the stones still rise singing their art. Vivi ficantem. Dear Brian Coffey in America, I still keep that photograph you took for me long ago. As such a guest and such an Irishman, how should I but feel constraint? And so the play of mind failed to imagine an unanswerable repudiation of ascendancy humanities. It is perhaps debatable whether Caesar was a renegade to the regent gods of sympathetic understanding, and in the battle that has no ending, went over to the giants who cherish ever their own dark incomprehension. What is self-evident is that Caesar's book is special pleading. But the answer, especially if time fortunately, out of silence, has universal validity and, for an Irishman, particular significance, is the generalization that a black and tan even one who has reserves of literary talent and polite manners is a black and tan. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooped a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had lain it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossoms in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering, through hollow lands and hilly lands. I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. I think it's great that you've taken poetry and turned it into a piece. It's, it's creative. I mean, what you do is, is really creative. And you do so much research for what you do. You, you know that background. You've 
got the whole story in your mind. You've, you know, you're looking at it from the perspective of an actor as well as someone who directs, who writes plays. You know, you pick up on the language and, and yeah. it, you know, you create the character too. Yeah, I think it's language is, a, is something I've always, I think I fell in love with language at yeah. a very early age. Yeah. You know, and I, and I still love, like, uh, I remember studying in, in, in high school, we had this wonderful Father Clark who, they were just starting this audio oral method of teaching Spanish. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, we didn't, we didn't see a textbook for two months. We went into class and he spoke Spanish the whole class. And really? we had to respond or learn on the spot, you know, this language, you know, he'd be saying, you know, close the door, open the window, and, you know, and you'd realize, okay, you know, favor de cerrar la ventana, you know, close the window, okay. you know, and you'd, this is how we learned. So, yeah. uh, and, and I thought, oh, this is really exciting. I love this, you know, and mm -hmm. I had been an altar boy, so I had some Latin. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed Latin, so when we studied Caesar's Gallic Wars, as everybody does in high school, yeah. I really got into that, um, you know, I mean, even recent years, you know, I'm, uh, um, I'm, I've taken Italian courses, because I just, I, I just like, it's like Spanish. Yeah. It's another romance language. Yeah. It, uh, it just has wonderful rhythms to it. You know, it's the language of so many good operas. Mm -hmm. And, but I, I took this, I was taking this course at Penn, and it was for veterans, actually. And we, we learning Italian through uh, watching Italian movies. Hmm. So you would go and watch the movies all in Italian, English subtitles, you know. Yeah. You could get the gist of it. And mind you, you know, the Sicilian dialect, quite different from Milanese or Roman, right. you know. Well, as uh, you know with the Irish, I mean, the Irish dialects are very different yeah, depending yeah. on the area you're in. Yeah, Curry, Cork, right. Belfast, you know, Dublin. Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm familiar with Dublin because I lived there for two yeah, years. Right. You know, but I have relatives in Belfast, mm -hmm. you know, and in, and in Derry, County Derry, Draperstown. Mm -hmm. And so the northern... The northern accent is quite distinct, very Scottish, right? Because of all the Scots who had emigrated, and that became the predominating sounds of Northern huh. Ireland. Uh, whereas Dublin has, you might have retentions of eighth-century Scandinavian invaders. Who knows what that North Dublin accent derives from? You know? Yeah, we'll have to ask Fergus Carey, Fergie. Fergie, are you out there? We yeah, <laughs> he's out there. <laughs> Fergie Maybe does, I'll have Fergie you do the, the Mr. Real. Dooley, uh, the Dooley <laughs> yeah. script at his bar, yeah. too. But I love, I love seeing Fergie, who visited me in the hospital and, and actually did his reading of Ulysses from Bloomsday uh. in my hospital room. And I just, I cried. It was yeah. wonderful. But Fergie has the authentic Dublin accent, uh -huh. you know. That's why I, I love meeting him, you know, and yeah. talking with him. Yeah. Uh, but... You know, and then the Cork accent is quite different, high and kind of musical. Yeah. You know. yeah. La, 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 la. Right, more of a, uh, yeah, musicality. But, and I would travel around Ireland kind of, again, my fascination with dialects and language all helped as a background for acting, which I yeah. didn't even know I was going to use this. But it did, be, it did come in very, very handy. And I've taught a lot of dialect now. Mm -hmm. You know, when I teach dialect, Irish dialect for a play or something, I, I you know, I have a structured learning thing that I learned both yeah. by ear as well as by instructors I had at University College Dublin. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan Bliss, who was the great Anglo-Irish dialect mm -hmm. professor, uh, went to Balliol College, Oxford, and was a great rower. But he he wrote the book on Anglo-Irish dialect. So, mm. you know, uh, you bring that I was to lucky Philly. to be on the ground floor and meet a lot of these fascinating people who also had little nuggets of knowledge to give to me that I could mm. use in my future, you know, theater career. I like how much you're talking about learning. I love that. You've <laughs> done so many plays. I just want to, you know, before we end our interview, which we could go on and on, and I love talking to you, some of the plays that you've done, The Weir at the Arden Theater. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, Major Barbara Shaw at the Arden. You've done a lot with Amaryllis Theater. Uh, Amaryllis, which yes. Which is a great company. Mimi Smith, yes. Mimi Smith and, um, yeah. and Steve Smith, Waiting for Godot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Molly Sweeney, it's on the Cherry Orchard with novel stages. Yes, yeah. Um, that was Harriet directed that, Harriet Power. Yeah. I should mention uh, Mimi Kenny Smith's uh, Amaryllis Theater mm -hmm. and uh, David Simpson, uh, 
who was the playwright, the play that I was performing, a one-man play, yes. his play, right before I was, uh, I was injured, uh, crossing the threshold into the house of Bach. Mm -hmm. And here David is blind from birth, him and his twin brother, Dan. Mm -hmm. David wrote this play, really autobiographical, about yeah. his life and his love of Bach. So when Mimi asked me to do the play, it was 96 pages long, mm -hmm. had all this music in, playing Bach on the organ, and I said, Mimi, I don't even play keyboard. How can I, <laughs> I fake? I have played a blind person before with Wilma Theater, okay. concert at St. Ovid Fair, yeah. with Blanca Juske directing. Uh, and, and I said, I can do a blind person, but a blind person playing Bach on the organ, two sets of keys and pedals, I, yeah. I'll, I'll be totally lost. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, no, no. You know, she came back to me a few days later. She said, David and everybody wants you to do it. Yeah. And I said, if David wants me to do it, okay, I'll do it. He's yeah. like a brother to me. Yeah. And, um, and we just lost. He was dying of ALS. He just died actually a few days ago. Yeah. I just got word. I know a wonderful so man. Sorry. So I you know, David, God and God has blessed you. You know. Yeah. He's um, going to watch over you too. Atheist that you are. We're with you. <laughs> uh, no, he's, too bad. Um, no. Uh, he's kidding. amazing. Yeah. No, he's, Dave, he's, in fact, Mimi told me it's a wonderful story. David's last words were, I think his home duty nurse, and I hope it's okay to say this, you know, his home duty nurse was asking, you know, does he want a you know, priest or a minister or something? And, and his wife told them, uh, no, he's an atheist, you know. And she said to David, do you believe in God? Now, mind you, his speech is ALS. His, sure. All his muscles are going, gone. Yeah. And he said, I believe in love. Oh. That was his last words, I believe in love. So wonderful. And his script, the script of the play was wonderful. It was, he's a poet. It was so beautiful. And doing it, I really, it really changed my life. Yeah. I really came to understand Bach, so much about Bach's music, mm -hmm. which my wife knows way better than I. Joanne knows much better. I'm a Mozart guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it was a real, again, learning thing for me. They, Dan worked with me. His brother Dan worked with me, uh, who's also sight deprived for playing the organ and mm -hmm. faking like you're blind, right. and also for movements on the stage. And we performed in a church, you know, the, uh, uh, I think it was uh, St. John's Episcopal or St. James Episcopal mm -hmm. in Elkins, St. John's Episcopal, I think, mm -hmm. in Elkins Park. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but it was interesting, after that play, people came up to me and said, they thought I was blind, and they thought I really knew how to play the organ. There you go again. <laughs> so I, well, I said wrong on both counts. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just acting, you know. Oh. It's just the acting. Uh, it's, it's, but I was glad to hear that. You know, I was honored, and, yeah. and I was lucky to do a decent job. But uh, it was an extraordinary experience doing David's words, bringing them alive, and mm -hmm. this great poet of the theater. And, mm -hmm. and we had acted together in a play, Blood Guilty, mm -hmm. another Irish play, Mimi directed. So there's. There's all that wonderful connection with the disability theater that yeah. I have too, and now I am part of disability yeah. theater. You know, so um, you are an amazing am, uh, person, and we are so lucky to have had you on the show. Oh, I'm lucky you to know? be here. Believe uh, me, and I thank, thank you, you so thank you. much. I thank you so much. I feel like we could talk for hours. Oh and yeah, I wish, we could. You know, sure. and, and it's been <laughs> such a treat yeah. to have you on the show, Michael. And oh. thank you so much for telling about your stories, about yeah. yourself as an artist. And then all the things that you've conquered yeah. in your life, and well, there's just, plenty of things I haven't. So you know, well, but Kirsten, it's it's a delight time. and a, a joy and, and an honor to be really to Thank do this you with so you. Much. Your your questions are right on, you know, <laughs> right on script, and they, they're not on, right on script, but they're very right on what the important things are. Well, that means in so theater much. and in life, really. That it's means just, so much to me, especially coming from someone like you. So I really oh. appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us on the Philadelphia Cultural Forum on CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's educational channel. Good night, and I'll see you next time.